Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I am your host, Doug Geinzer, and we're here in the studio today with Dr. John Dougherty, the new dean of the Toro University School of Medicine. For those of you that are new to the show or this is your first time watching, we do broadcast every single Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, and you are able to chat with the uh, guest here today by visiting the VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live. So if you have any questions, please feel free to go online. Again, VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live, and you'll be able to ask those questions. Welcome to the studio, Dr. Dowerty. Thank you, Doug. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're new to Las Vegas, so uh, tell us about yourself. Well, um, I moved here from Kansas City with my family. I've got uh, two sons still at home. My wife and I, we live in the Henderson area. Uh, prior to that, uh, being in Kansas City, we were in Joplin, Missouri, and uh, yes, we were there when the tornado hit. That's always a common question. <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, we've, uh, this is my 20th year, an undergraduate or graduate medical education, started on the hospital side, learned the residency aspect of physician training, and then about, oh, I guess it's been close to nine, ten years ago now, I moved over to the undergraduate or the medical student side of, of the training process. Yeah. So how's the family liking Las Vegas? It's a Love big change it. from Kansas. You know, it's it's absolutely wonderful. The people here are so friendly, uh, genuinely uh, very nice everywhere you go. Um, I love the sun coming up in, over the mountains in the yeah. morning. I love the sun going down over the mountains at night. It's it's gorgeous. And we it love looks it. like you got to take a tour of, uh, well, Scott, if you could pull that vi- picture back up. Is yes, that the Hoover Dam? Yes, right? we did. And that's my gorgeous wife there to my left. That's Sarah. And uh, with members, uh, Rabbi Kripka from, uh, is standing there on the far right from Turo, New York. And uh, part of our, our uh, orientation when we had the board here was we got able to go to the dam. Yeah, that dam. So yeah. have you been able to see other parts of Las Vegas? Yes. Uh, I, I, we were mentioning earlier, I think we were all smarter before GPS. Uh, <laughs> but uh, from a variety of, um, of missed turns, I've actually seen more of Las Vegas than I probably anticipated. <laughs> But uh, I am learning my way around, and it's it's great. We we are very grateful to be here. Very fortunate. So, when did you get officially appointed dean? I officially became dean on February first. Um, I am the second dean at the university. Our founding dean, Dr. Mitchell Foreman, has done an amazing job on setting the table. I could not have think of a better person to put down the foundation of this institution and bring it to the point to where it is now. And I, I'm blessed to have followed in his footsteps to begin to continue to build on that foundation that he has created. Yeah, we've done a lot of work with Dr. Foreman over the years, yes. especially with the grand opening of Toro University. He was one of our uh, recipients oh, last yes, year. He is. So, yes, he was indeed. Uh, Inspired Excellence in Healthcare Awards. He's done yeah. so much for the Valley, and it's, it's you've got big footsteps to follow in oh, there. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. So how did you find out about this opportunity, and how did you select Las Vegas? Well, interestingly, it was Dr. Foreman that recruited me. I had been um, at a meeting where he was attending, and uh, at the time I had four other uh, opportunities on the table to consider, and when Dr. Foreman found out that I was open to the consideration of leaving Kansas City, he uh, gave me a phone call. We talked for about an hour and a half. He he made his pitch on on why this is a wonderful place to be and why Turo was an incredible institution to be part of. And so I came out and then I saw that he was 1,000% accurate and talked to my wife and we said this is this is really a good place, good good way direction for us to move as we you know go through my the rest of my. And career. at what point did Shelley Berkeley strong arm you because you know, know Shelley's got that that strength. <laughs> I will tell you. Um, so you know you do your due diligence now, same way people will be doing this. We got on the internet, and as soon as I saw some of the interviews that Shelley had done, I realized what an amazing leader that we have here, not only for Toro, but in the Valley in general. She has. The, the longer that I'm with the organization, the more I find that she has accomplished for the entire citizenship of the Valley. And it's incredible to be able to work with her and under her and just to be able to learn from her every day that I'm at work. She teaches me something new. And She's I, done an amazing job representing Nevada, Board of Regents, oh Congresswoman. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It's We had her in the studio a couple weeks back, and I told Scott, our, our producer here, look, this gal's going to come in. She's going to be one time, sit down, and yes. done. He said, I've never seen that happen. And sure enough, yeah. she hit it. She's just so well-spoken. I agree. 
Could, couldn't have a better boss, that's for sure. Yeah. So where did you do your medical training? Where did you start? Well, I did medical school in Kansas City. Uh-huh. Um, actually, I had been part of that institution for almost 25 years uh, from the medical student side to contributing to faculty as a outside community member to actually being on staff there. So, yep. And then went on to Texas to do residency training in family medicine, followed that with a fellowship in sports medicine, and uh more recently, as far as education goes, I was uh, one of the uh, National Health Policy Fellows, so that's kind of added to my acumen as we move forward. In this. That's so. cool. So tell us about sports medicine. You just got back from the Dominican Republic, yes. and uh, tell us about that. Well, I, um, I came through college as a collegiate two-sport athlete mm-hmm. and um, knew that I thought I was going to go into teaching and save some money and then eventually go to medical school, long story short. You know, I wound up going to medical school instead of going into the classroom. And uh, because I was going to do that athletic trainer, the sports medicine component really spoke to me. And I worked through that through medical school. And then Mm -hmm. um, in sports medicine, the the rule is if you don't ask, they can't say no. (laughs) So I asked to go and contribute and participate in a lot of things. I've been very fortunate. And I've uh, kind of crafted my practice in the last multiple years to just basically taking care of college and uh, professional athletes. Mm -hmm. And And the affiliation with the Kansas City Royals. Tell us about that. The Royals are a wonderful organization. When I moved to uh, Arkansas to help uh, my brother and I went into practice together in sports medicine, he's orthopedics, I'm Mm -hmm. primary care. Uh, The Royals moved their organization from Wichita to Northwest Arkansas. We were interviewed and we were selected to be their team physicians there. And, Part of my background, I do a little unusual stuff in sports medicine. I kind of do a, a biomechanics, which is I can kind of predict, you know, based on your physical exam, when you're going to get injured and what kind of injury you're going to have. And that's a very mm-hmm. unique skill set. And we put in a rehab protocols and processes. So as I, when I left Northwest Arkansas as their head team medical physician, I went to uh, Kansas City and continued to contribute as an organizational physician, primarily focusing on the minor leagues and my team. Uh, happens to be the uh, the academy team in the Dominican Republic. So very cool. Yeah, we go down there and we we assess the athletes uh, before they come stateside, um, and then work. Uh, fortunately for us, we then would go out to the community and start taking care of the people that live in and around the baseball academy there. Just uh, it's a little bit east of Santo Domingo uh, in a town called Guerra. Wow. So tell us about that. So you, you go to the Dominican Republic, you uh, venture outside of the walls. True. Uh, you uh, get to see the real countryside, Absolutely. get to treat some of the, the population there in the Dominican. What what's what are some of those experiences, and how do you bring those back into academ- academic medicine? Well, I take students with me every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very enlightening opportunity for the students who see the, the patients that we care for here. Um, even in the Valley, the students uh, – they do get to see people that have challenges with a variety of different components of the healthcare, whether it's insurance or, you know, their physical well-being or, you know, whatever it may be. But when you go to the Dominican and you come around a corner and, and you see that everybody lives in metal sheds, corrugated tin sheds that we would call a garage shed, you know, a lawnmower shed. You put your stuff in the back corner of the house, but that's the entire village. Um, it really has an impact on them, and they're a lot more grateful for what they have, and it helps them to put things into perspective relative to the big picture. Uh, so it's it's very meaningful to the students to be able to grasp that. And then on the other side of the coin, we work with two medical schools in the Dominican Republic, work with the Minister of Health, work with the military, um, and uh, we have collaborated with them on ad- identifying particular types of disease, disease states indigenous to a, an area. They've the government has done an amazing job down there. They put in new water treatment plants to try to address the issues with parasites. Um, they've put in clinics. We've worked with the medical schools to help staff those clinics. So it's been great. Fantastic. So you were a ball player yourself yes, through sir. college. Yes, sir. What, what sport did you play? Um, I played uh, football and I played tennis. I walked onto the tennis team and made the tennis team. Never played tennis before college, but made the team. Wow. And then you had an opportunity to play professional ball, and you chose to go to medical <laughs> school. And... Well, um, I I was rather fast as a youngster. That was my kids remind me that was thirty pounds and thirty years ago. <laughs> but um, I used to run a four two forty, which uh, there's probably less than one percent of the people in the NFL that can run that fast. And I came out. Uh, I'd already been accepted to medical school, and I went down to the. Uh, 
pro day and the head football coach came out and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go run for these guys. He said, no, 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 no. He goes, somebody's going to put you on their practice squad. You won't go to medical school. And I can't live with myself because I've never had a football player make it to med school. I've had a few go to the pros. And if you do that, you won't go. And I, that'll be horrible for, for I'm like, all right. So I, I did not go and run for the pros. Do you thing. regret that decision at all? You know, some days we all have that sentence. We can finish, uh, you know, when I was 23, I wish I had. Sure, sure. So I can finish that sentence with that anecdote. But uh, all of us have a different answer to that. So I, I try to make for sure for my children that I give them the opportunity to finish that sentence in a way different than mine with a, with a hint of regret. Yeah. And you were also in theater in college. I was uh, the only uh, two-sport athlete that also was in the National uh, Theater uh, Fraternity so I was, uh, I, I was a four-year vocal scholar and uh, paid most of my way singing uh, through college and uh, also did a lot of theater, a lot of leads and collegiate plays and summer stock and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and, you know, doing that is a lot of fun. So we've got a, a, one of our guests uh, chatted in a question. Thank you, Nick, for that question. And the question is, what made you get into academia? You know, when I was an undergraduate, my undergraduate was in um, education. So like I mentioned earlier, I was going to go and teach. And when I went into residency programs, uh, I kind of restructured and reorganized the curriculum because I thought it could be stronger. And then when I left, um, the program kind of declined from an academic standpoint. The hospital turned around about four or five months after I left and asked me to come back and lead the educational component. So I've been in education now ever since. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about Toro. It's a unique university. It's a Jewish-owned and run university. It's a, it's a Jewish-affiliated institution. Um, we have a total of um, 29 schools all over the world. We have four internationals. We have five medical schools, Wow. four osteopathic schools, one allopathic school, one in California uh, in the Vallejo area, uh, three in New York, and um, schools in Germany, Israel, um, Paris, and uh, Moscow. Yeah, I don't think our local population realizes the footprint that Toro has around the world. It's not just here, but it's Correct. around the U.S. and Berlin and Israel. That's that. absolutely the you know the goal and objective for each of those uh, facilities is to help meet the needs of the community in which they they are. Yeah. A prime example is Toro University Nevada, uh, Nevada. They they the whole focus is helping address the healthcare uh, shortages here mm -hmm. in the valley. I think something else that our, our population doesn't quite understand is you're really the first medical school in Las Vegas. Correct. Correct. And, you know, we've, we've got two new med schools being built, but Toro's been here. When did, when did Toro open up in Las Vegas? Toro's first graduating class was in 2008, and mm -hmm. we graduate 135 students a year. This year we have, I believe it's uh, 18 or 19 students when they graduated, matriculated into training programs here in the Valley, so they are going to stay. Our goal and objective is to accomplish as many of those students into residency programs here in the Valley. And that's why the participation by the hospitals in expanding those residency programs is so crucial to us, assisting us in meeting our mission. Yeah, we're going to touch on graduate medical education a bit, and you've got a lot of experience in that area. I do, I do indeed. Yeah, before we dive into that, tell us, you know, you're an osteopathic medical school. Yes, sir. How does that differ from an allopathic well, uh, it's, a, it's a philosophy. It's a little mm -hmm. bit different of a perspective. Osteopathic medicine was started uh, around the Civil War by a physician who at the time didn't think that the medicines of the day were actually accomplishing what their intentions were. Remember, that's when mercury and arsenic was a big you know, treatment plan, leeches. And he felt as though there's got to be a better way. And he thought the medicine at the time was actually harming the patients more than they were helping. So that was pre-vaccinations, pre-antibiotics, pre-IV fluids, for goodness sake. So he started this philosophy of the body has ability to take care of itself, and you have to get the structural component of the body in line so its own you know, well-being can be accomplished. And now we know more about immunology. We know more about microbiology. We know more about you know, a variety of different foundational sciences that we didn't then. And medicine in total has probably come more towards his philosophy doesn't matter if it's allopathic or osteopathic. And we use the term often holistic. Holistic is we try to engender in the, pay, in the students that the individual in front of them is exactly that. It's an individual that, mm -hmm. you know, we're not talking about the pneumonia in room 212. We're talking about Mrs. Smith who has pneumonia in 212. And that's not a unique philosophy to osteopathic medicine anymore. 
But it is something that we really emphasize to the students, and we want them to come out of our institution with that in their head that, you know, they're there to take care of the person. Mm -hmm. Now, Toro also owns an allopathic med school in New York. Correct, sir. And so how do they collaborate? How do you work together there? And what's the relationship between the two schools? Because it's unique that you have that perspective to be able to look down the uh, the pipe of both of them. True. Um, the school there is in Valhalla, New York, mm-hmm. and it's New York Medical College. And that uh, institution has just recently folded into the Turo family, meaning the last several years. We have meetings annually uh, for the whole board, and all of the schools are represented at those meetings. And the deans um, are beginning to collaborate between institutions relative to philosophy, educational opportunities, and resources. The schools in uh, Harlem, that's New York Harlem, right across the street from the Apollo Theater, wow. I can't wait to go there, <laughs> um, is uh, you know probably uh, a couple, three years into graduating their classes. There's another school in Middletown, New York, which is uh, just having their students in their third year. And the New York Medical College has been a long-established allopathic institution, but again, mm-hmm. they've just folded into the family recently. Yeah. So let's dive into the topic of graduate medical education. Sure. You've got a lot of experience there. I was looking at your background, and you've you've been the chair of several different groups. Uh, as you know, Las Vegas Heels started the conversation around graduate medical education about, I think it was back in 2011, we rounded a bunch of people up into a room and said, hey, we need to expand GME in the market. What's that going to look like? That group, it led to a the formation of a task force that was headed up by Dr. Joe Hardy, who's over there on faculty yes, with you all. Great and Joe, uh, D- Senator uh, Hardy, gave us some amazing leadership throughout this entire process. And uh, that led to the governor forming a, a, a formal task force, and that brought forward our recommendations and ultimately led to $10 million in funding. Um, I want to talk about a couple different things. I want to go back and hear some of your experiences before in the past, but really talk about that $10 million a bit. Is Toro, did you submit on that uh, the bid for that? Yeah, or the, yeah, the, I've been appointed by, the, by Governor Sandoval to that task force, awesome. so I'll, I will be representing on that. The, med, the money goes to hospitals. That's a common confusion. Medical schools um, do not... Um, graduate residents from the school. They work in collaboration with a hospital who does the training for the physicians, and then their name goes in collaboration with the hospital. So if it's our sponsor that we have here is Valley Hospital, so they graduate from our consortium, which includes the hospital and the medical school. The hospitals, the residency programs are funded through the hospitals through Medicare. And unless you are a Medicare provider and you have a Medicare ID number, you cannot receive funding to uh, train the residents. So as such, the residents are employees of the hospitals. They're the uh, training responsibility under the accrediting bodies is underneath the hospital. And the medical schools give support relative to simulation lab, library, anatomy lab, all of the academic pieces of the puzzle that a hospital may or may not want to build as an infrastructure piece. And then we, if you will, subcontract in common terms Mm -hmm. to provide those services so they can give them solid training. So recently, uh, there was some movement to bring together the residency or the GME between allopathic and osteopathic. Sure. And that's all, I believe, supposed to come together by 2019. What does that do to change things actually it started in 2015 (laughs) last year and uh, the way that it had come through the years is there were um, osteopathic residency programs that were accredited by the american osteopathic association or the aoa and then there were the accreditation council on graduate medical education or the acgme Mm -hmm. did the uh, evaluation and the approval of all of the md quote-unquote residencies And through the years, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the philosophy has pretty much been centralized. And in essence, the programs have had standards that were just a little variable. Now they've agreed upon standards. And there's a single accreditation system that's being, that has been created. They don't like the word merger. Um, (laughs) But in essence, any student, regardless of the philosophy of the school that they trained in, will have the opportunity to go into a program that's under the umbrella of the ACGME. And before I came to Las Vegas, I had started about, um, oh, a little over 370 new residency positions in and around, well, for the school in Kansas City. And as part of the result of that, I was named to the ACGME. So I think I'm one of the few deans 
MD or DO that are a member of the ACGME. So in Kansas, I want to look down and make sure I get this right. You were the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs and Graduate Medical Education. Correct. Um, And then on top of that, you were the Chief Academic Officer of Graduate Medical Education Consortium. Correct. Tell us about that, and does any of that, can it come into play here in Las Vegas? Oh, absolutely. So uh, we had in Kansas City what was known as a decentralized model. The medical school was not attached to a hospital. Often uh, it's common for the medical schools to have a a hospital right across the street, Mm -hmm. and the students and the residents contribute to their educational process. In today's day and age, a decentralized model is much more feasible with the technology that we have. This is a prime example. Right now, uh, we had traditionally what we refer to as the sage on the stage. You know, someone would get up front, just like all of us went to high school, and let's talk about algebra today. You know, let's talk about, you know, diabetes today, and you'd have a auditorium full of residents and students that were in clinical education. Now, with the way that we have technology, we apply that technology. And we had, uh, in Kansas City, I had residents that were in four different time zones. But I could deliver them all the same content by using this type of a tool and then some asynchronous question and answer sessions on a, on a chat board, if you will. So being able to have that experience of being in diverse systems there is an opportunity that uh, we could accomplish similar thing, minimize the or maximize our resources, minimize the overhead associated with these training programs, which could then allow the hospitals to provide more training programs because their mm-hmm. dollar is going to go a little farther. So there's some you know examples of that nationwide. In Wisconsin, there's a prime example of that uh, system. And right now, the uh, the hospitals that have been in, you know, that have done an amazing job for the Valley and their training programs have not used that model. But I think as we have more programs mm-hmm. come on, it's a significant opportunity for us to enhance the education of all of those physicians in training and therefore the patients that they're going to care for. You bet. So we all know that the expansion of GME residency programs is going to be a huge coup for Las Vegas. It's, I Absolutely. believe the numbers, 67% of these doctors stay behind where they did their residency. Correct. Within an hour of where they train, yes. That's big. So from a growth perspective for Toro, does this allow you to grow the medical school? Do you, because you now have an outlet, is that part of the the planning process? Where does, does, where does Toro leverage up on this? You know, you have to have responsible growth. Mm -hmm. So before you like, just kind of like you alluded to, before you add more medical students to the mix, you need to be contributing to where those individuals are going to go at this moment in time. We have, we're in, uh, the state is a net exporter of medical students. We train between currently the two medical schools on some 60 and ourselves 135, 195 students. There's only roughly 138 first year positions available. Um, we had a meeting just a couple of days ago between the two schools. I believe we have just shy of 40 of those 195 were able to find residency positions in the state. Wow. So we net exported between the two existing schools. What is the difference? A hundred, you know, whatever that is. 150. That's 150 a lot. students that went to California, Utah, Texas, Arizona. And it's not because those students didn't want to stay. It's because there may not have been the opportunity. Now, we did bring in an additional 90 or so students Mm -hmm. from other states. Many of those may have been individuals that accomplished their undergrad here in the state or have family here and wanted to get back. But by the hospitals and expanding and growing that, like you said before, they usually stay within an hour of where they train as a resident. We're going to hopefully keep more of those and then keep that investment, those dollars that the state is putting into medical student education, into resident education, and have the higher return on investment here within the state as opposed to benefiting our neighbors. Yeah, and it's by our estimates, it looks like we're going to almost quadruple the number of residency slots Correct. into that if we do it right. And that's, that's what I think is on the board at this time, and I think various institutions are at various, varying degrees of executing that plan. So, and, you know, with my background, I'm, I've kind of have a, a niche expertise in finance and organization and accreditation for graduate medical education. I think, you know, that is probably one of the uh, a significant reason why I was 
selected to accomplish the role as dean here. Well, you obviously bring a lot of experience, and we can learn from that. We're, uh, we're, we're working our way through this whole GME expansion process, and we all know that that starts leading to fellowship programs Absolutely. and that specialty and subspecialty type training because we can't get that until we get the residency programs right. in place. It's a chicken or egg concept. You know, and we have talked a little bit, you and I, in the past about um, – you know, medical tourism. Mm -hmm. And as it stands now, I think we're also a net exporter for medical tourism because there's some specialties that I know that people in the region would like to have accomplished and stay home, but yet they have to leave the city to get that specialty care. So those fundamental foundational residencies, the primary care residencies are critically important, but we do need to look towards accomplishing programs that will bring those specialties. So our people can stay home. They don't have to leave They don't have to leave the area to go seek that care. Yeah, it's our desire for Las Vegas to become the most globally recognized destination for health and wellness travel. And we've got a ways to go. Absolutely. Uh, but we've got a strategic plan in place. And a lot of that plan was we needed to fix the people factor. Right. Uh, we needed to have a pipeline of new physicians. And Toro's uh, giving us the, the highest volume right now of new Correct. graduates coming out. We have indeed. And the same way that Dr. Foreman laid the foundation of the school back in 2004, I think the efforts of Las Vegas Heels and of the community at large you know, we're beginning to see the reward of this uh, this investment by Turo into the community, um, you know, going on 13 years ago. I know it's kind of hard now. You, you plant that seed, you water that seed, and eventually it will bear fruit. But if you don't initiate that process, you never will. Well, it's bearing fruit. We see that. Absolutely. And we thank you for that. No, we're, we're proud to be a part of the bigger picture. So, so one of the other things that you're doing, you're you're, you're changing up or uh, adjusting or getting alignment with the curriculum. What does that look like? What does that mean to the community and the the new students of Toro? Well, I would say that this generation learns differently than when we went to school, and there are certain things that appeal to them that are different. Um, They're more uh, service-minded. There's more community-oriented, so we're beginning to integrate more service learning where the students will go out into the community, engage the community as part of their learning Um, And that way it will help cement their relationship with the community and hopefully get them to come back and stay. Uh, Also, we're going to be working on individualization of the clinical years. If we have students that are strong academically and they know that they want to go into surgery, that we're going to give them additional opportunities during their third year to follow that path. And hopefully in this very competitive residency environment, give them a leg up on the competition because we want to keep our kids at home. We want them to be the first choice for the hospitals, for the residency programs, and they'll already have uh, roots here in the community, and then they'll stick around. So we've got a few more minutes left. Uh, tell us about the other programs that Turo has to offer there. Oh, Turo has done an amazing job in addressing all of the healthcare care needs. We have uh, physician assistants. Uh, we have occupational therapy students, physical therapy, nursing, all the way up to our brand-new uh, uh, nurse practitioner program that's going to start in the fall. Um, We also have an education department. We're trying to collaborate with the uh, school district to help uh, fulfill some of those goals and objectives. And then if we have students that maybe did not have as strong as an academic background in the sciences, we have a master's in health sciences that will help them be stronger applicants in any of those programs. So, Dr. Dowdy, we want to thank you for being on the program today. It's been a great pleasure having you here with us today. Appreciate your time. It's flown. Absolutely. So next week on Inside Medicine, we've got we're going to have a couple of folks here to talk about the recently passed expedited licensure bill, and that bill allows us to get new doctors credentialed and licensed in the state of Nevada uh, within 45 days from a complete application submission. We're going to have two great guests on here. We're going to have Vance Farrow who is with the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and he is the healthcare specialist. And then we're going to have Dr. John Grossmith, who is a new neurosurgeon that will be opening up the Bonatti Spine Institute that was one of our first uh, doctors to go through this process. So we uh, encourage everybody to join us next Friday, 10 o'clock, right here at thevegasvideonetwork.com slash live. Or, of course, if you missed the show, you could always watch it on lasvegasheels.org. And next week, we will be talking about expedited licensure. We thank you all for being here with us today. And, Dr. Dougherty, if you want to tell people how they could get in touch with you, that would be wonderful. If you're interested, you can reach us at uh, tun.turo.edu, and you can find a link to contact us there. Very good. Well, we thank you, and everybody, you have a great day. Thank you, sir.